Okay. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the um, Emma's Back to the Cell Study course. Looking forward to getting back into our collective cells in 2021 this year. Um, this course um, is mainly focused on the recruit at the recruit level, um, going through um, the plays start to finish in the Getty. Uh, taking the Getty manuscript and Fiori is our, our primary source, and um, going through the plays and trying to look at, analyze, and understand things that um, we would likely miss if we were training, um, you know, uh, every week on the south floor, because of course there is a large distance between um, things that your instructors will tell you on the south floor and what's actually in the manuscript. There's a lot of work that needs to be done to take it from the page to the floor. And so it's great to be able to take some time to to look at it and also make it a part of our normal study as, as well. Um, uh, though we've had the fortune to have uh, other free scholars um, and other senior members of Emma here in the Monday sessions over the last 20 something weeks, um, I've been the principal um, sort of uh, voice in this back to the cell study course. Um, but regardless, uh, it's important that you know, of course, that our view, the view of the person leading this session is merely one of many, right? This is a scholarship. Uh, this is an act of scholarship we're doing here in a scholarly organization. So we, as students, we don't want you to believe something is so just because we said it. Um, we want you to be convinced by the same evidence that we're convinced by. And looking at and pointing out the evidence that makes something uh, X or Y is partly what we're doing here, right? And and learning. So um, with all of that said, um, let's get ourselves situated. I've been gone for two weeks. I had a baby, so that was a thing. Um, I'm but pretty sleep deprived. Specifically, your wife had a baby. Well, you know, we. <laughs> And you got you got a full inundation into daddyhood. That's right. That's right. I'm full. Oh, thank you, Kel. Yeah, I am covered in baby vomit, but I'm just letting it kind of seep into the skin, so I don't notice it anymore. Um, but anyways, it's been a very um, sleep deprived last couple of weeks, but um, here I am. Life goes on. Um, so we're we're continuing in the um, second half of the Getty here. So we spent around 20 weeks or so going through the Getty from the beginning um, all the way through to the Senyo page, looking at all of the uh, um, all of the main sections. Um, we're using this little this little wiki tool that I made a bunch of years ago, um, but um, we're trying to give the folio notation to anybody who's following in their own copies of Fiore. Uh, if they have them at home, you're more than welcome to do that. And so yeah, we finished that first half, and then we went into the second, as it were, half of the book which is the um, armor section, as it were, or the section that has three sections in armor, um, sword, axe, spear, and then mounted uh, combat, um, which is, I think there's some armor in it, but it's mostly shown out of armor, I think, in the illustrations, but whatever, that's what's in the second half of the book. I'm just going to close Steam here. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. And so last week... Well, over the last two weeks that I was gone, we more or less, as I understand, dealt with the sword and armor section. So that's great. Um, I'm sure all that was necessary to have said was said in the last two weeks, so I won't um, labor any more on it, um, except to help us um, get some context for the next section where we're going to be at, which is the axe. All right. So today we're going to be starting the axe section. So, um, uh, uh, mm -hmm. quick question. Do we, yes. we actually finish the uh, sword and armor section? Because uh, I think the last thing was the first counter, the first scholar. Sorry, the first scholar, the first counter. Can you, can you like check that again? Uh, yeah. You know, so, well, actually, so so let me let me take a pause here. Like I sh um, I try to remember, but I often forget. And I forgot today. Let me pause here to say uh, before we continue into new material. Does anybody have any questions about any previous material? So, Alex, you asked that question. I believe the last play we did was this guy last oh, week. Okay, yeah. Looks and good. he is the yeah. last. Yeah, he is the last guy. But um, on that note, does anybody have any nagging questions 
or things that they've they've been thinking about over the last week? Um, Beatty put it to me that uh, somebody had asked him about differences between our standards of fighting, our techniques and whatnot at Emma, and uh, you know real high end SEA or other groups. Uh, other organizations of, outside of the, ah. the WMA or, or HEMA world, depending on how you want to look at historically European martial arts or Western martial arts. Um, so I, I, I said, well, since I have a lot, a lot of experience in the SEA world, I'd be happy to do that. Um, so whoever asked Beatty that question, you know, um, tell me what you want to know. And if, it, if that person isn't here tonight or, or whatever, you can uh, direct your questions to me, uh, Kate Rakuda at Emma.org, and uh, I'll do my best to answer you because I spent 23 years in the SCA, uh, and eight of it, at least eight of it, as the chief sort of referee of all fighting in Ontario. So I've seen more bouts than you've heard about. <laughs> it's frightening how many how many tournaments and fights and fight practices I've been to so I'm real familiar with SCA standards anyways and if there are no questions all the better because they're not worth your time <laughs> yeah so uh, Kel is definitely your man to ask th those questions to I don't believe Kel that they're here at the moment the particular um, uh, individual individuals but uh, we can yeah you know, yeah yeah we'll definitely um, we'll pin it we'll put a pin in it for when they they're able to come because I'm there's lots of armor section left and I'm sure they'll be able to make it in the next few weeks um, but sure. that is definitely really interesting uh, 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 question I look forward to when it's asked um, Okay, yeah. So, um, with with that, without further ado, let's um, start in the axe section. All right. Now, like I I like to do um, uh, before we start sections, I like to get a little context to kind of trace a border around what we're looking at before we jump in. So um, we've already we already spent a decent amount of time in the sword and armor section because it's the first armored section starting at the beginning of the book. It's the first armor section we encounter. We spent a lot of time not only contextualizing sword and armor, but also armor itself. So that's going to carry on, all right? That, that, all, that, uh, all that stuff is going to carry on into the axe and the spear. Um, so we have to hold that in our minds, right? And all, all that stuff is recorded so we can go back and, and look at it again if we want. Um, but what else is there to say about the um, about the axe? Well, looking at what we did in the last two weeks in the sword uh, in two hands section, um, to get a flavor of the axe, I think it's useful to contrast these two, the plays of these two. So, though it's true that the sword can the sword in armor can have a Largo space to it, right? Thinking back to our um, long discussion of the sword in two hands out of armor, right? In its, uh, broadly speaking, two categories, two distance categories, Largo and Stretto. While it's true that the sword in armor can have a Largo element to it, all of the plays in sword and armor here are effectively in Stretto. What, what we would conventionally consider Joko Stretto, right? And the sword and armor tends to jet to, to go here rather than stay far at Largo at the tips um, because a lot of the stuff that you can do to defeat the armor requires a more tender touch <laughs> than you can give at Largo at the tips of the sword. Right, all of these um, these pommel strikes and you know putting putting the sword or the pommel into that box there that Cal talked about a few weeks ago, she, you know thrusting to the face and two hands, you know putting force to the points, be beating the armor, right, punch puncturing the mail, um, you know with with your grip and all these things, keys, locks, all these things, they're very difficult to do at Largo, right? Largo is great for lopping limbs off. Right, and put it pushing thrust through people's bodies um, and faces and things like that. But the armor, 
with against the sword makes you proof to a lot of Largo threat. Not completely, of course, but it makes you proof to a lot of it, right? Um, thrusts are still deadly, obviously, um, but uh, mo a lot of the thrusting targets are gone, especially if you have a closed visor, right? You basically have the four points, uh, armpits, um, maybe maybe hip joints and crotch, and behind, right? So the, the long story short is that sword and armor is often going to come to a stretto place. And this is the kind of flavor that we expect with sword and armor, sword and two hands. But axe is not quite like that. So it seems. The axe can actually defeat the armor. Um, the armor isn't um, like, okay, so the, word, the operative word there is can right? Um, the axe is a weapon designed, as I understand, in order to make the de defeating armor easier, right? To counter the armored man specifically. And as such, blows from the axe, both with the hammer and with the, the spike, as well as, of course, the thrust on the point, all can defeat armor pretty, pretty well. Um, the spike cannot, you know, can stab, right? The spear point can stab, but the hammer can all, can can give concussive force injury um, to people's heads, to their limbs, right? That can take them out. So um, armor isn't proof against the axe in the way that it is kind of against the sword, right? Um, so the for that reason. The axe has a little bit more of a Largo space to it. Though we're going to see in the axe section, we're going to see Stretto plays, because of course we are. We're also going to see some Largo plays, right? Like, look at this one, right? We have a, um, a thrust to the face and a step on the axe. We also have this one. This is, this is awesome, right? He's disarmed the axe and he's, uh, um, and he's he struck him. I actually think this follows this one. Um, but so, uh, and of course we're going to see some trick plays as well. Um, so though there is Stratto in the axe, because of course there is, because the axe can defeat armor, um, we're going to, we're going to see some Largo element to it as well. All right. So that's really neat. Um, and it's also terrifying. The axe is an absolutely, an absolutely terrifying weapon. Full stop. That's it. It's a spear. It's a hammer. You know, it can it can open up people in armor. It can it can defeat armor. It's the Swiss Army knife of medieval weapons. Just just goddamn human beings are are cruel cruel creatures. It's also so simple. You know, it's so simple. I mean, it's not this poison polax you know flail stuff, but it's just a hammer on the end of a on the end of a solid shaft. But goddamn, it's gross. It's gross. You can you can mash somebody's brains through with 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 force delivered through the steel <laughs> without even breaking the steel you can kill somebody with a hammer blow to the head you know it's ridiculous so the the axe is a is a, gr a gross weapon uh, arguably one of the most iconic of the late medieval weapons of war um quite a quite a fearsome thing and that's what we're up to uh now so it's not isn't that cool um now before we get into it the guards i want to watch a video um, but before we watch the video, I'll pause. Any questions so far or comments, uh, Kel? Anything to add so far? You're doing great, man. Keep going. All right. So let's watch this video. Um, this is from 2012. This is a fight with the axe between John Woods, a uh, uh, free scholar of um, uh, Emma Ottawa, and uh, Matt Brundle, free scholar of Emma Toronto. No. Uh, a scholar. I'm, I apologize. Scholar. Um long-standing scholar at in Toronto and uh, it's a great fight so let's watch it can everybody see my screen okay it's called a hound skull typically of an Italian design and then John on the right so they got a, uh, there's a, a head on it with all right let's go so just to pause here the axes that um they're using are axes with a um what's the material kel do you remember it's it's uh 
very dense rubber. Yeah, it's a it's a <laughs> it's a very it's a dense non steel material, right? Non metal material. It's been spray painted silver. Uh, yeah. Material yeah. density is about in the middle between winter tire or, or yeah. I say a summer tire, not mm. winter, because summer mm. tires are harder. Mm. A summer car tire and a hockey puck. Yeah. It's not as hard as a hockey puck, but it's it's harder than a tire. It does not collapse very yeah. much. It doesn't. Uh, no. And having been hit with a hockey puck at really <laughs> high speed, I've been hit with an axe at really high speed. Yeah. I'd rather get hit with the hockey puck. It doesn't have as much weight behind it. Yeah, and, and so this is a, I wanted to mention this detail because um, these axes are real. Now they're not as they're not as deadly as if they would be with steel, but if you took a square shot to the side of the head with one of these, it could definitely kill you. In full armor. Yeah. In and, full armor. Uh, I did a, a seminar. Bo and I went uh, to Montreal in 2012. I did a seminar for a group there where we went through all the Fiori during the weekend. Mm. And in the afternoon, we got into the pole axes. People were, of course, play acting and whatnot. And the few people that showed up in armor were sort of confused about the things I was showing them. Mm. So I got one of the fellows that I was using at Zugadori to say, you know, let a few people hit you, put his helmet on, and, and people were hitting him with what they thought was good blows. And he started laughing, like laughing. He was, he was almost tickled. So then I said, I'm going to hit you with a light blow. And I hit him upside the head on his, about his left ear. Yeah. And he fell down. Yeah. He just felt, and it wasn't a hard blow. It was yeah. Like, you know, one of my rising shots. Yeah. So the kind of thing, these axes could cave your head in. Yeah. But they're safe enough that they'll at worst dent your helmet if it's not uh, uh, spring steel. If it's, you know, regular mild steel, you can dent the helmet with these pretty easily. Yeah, and, and so why this is important is because um, if you remember back when we when we talked about the Senyo page, we talked about um, we talked about uh, Audacia at the end. One of the things that in uh, a higher s skill level in the art allows you to do is it allows you to experience higher and higher degrees of risk in a way that isn't crazy, right? In a way that's safe ish safe enough to to do right and so this thing these guys are fighting with with weapons that could absolutely kill them despite the fact they're in full armor they're fighting with them but they're fighting with them in a way that's very highly like tuned these guys are paying the, as much attention as possible they're riding the line between force and an injury as best as they can and the only way that we get this kind of thing is when we have people who are skilled enough to do that. Because otherwise, if they're, if people are, aren't skilled enough, it's way too dangerous. And you have to either not, uh, you have to either um, compensate by using uh, less real pole axes, like axes with foam heads or some bullshit, or you have to, yeah, or you have to compensate with rules. And you say you're not allowed to do X or Y. There's none of that shit. These guys are going for it. They're just trying to, you know, they're trying to do it as much as they can, and and but but not end up hurting their friend. All right. So without further ado, let's watch it. I got you, yeah. Being overcommitted with a pole axe is a really really bad plan. As you just saw there, Stop 
All right. That was sweet. That was a great last. Uh, that's a great play at the end there. Um, all right. Cool. So the axe. Can I ask a quick question? By axe, mm -hmm. pole axe, right? Like it's never just like uh, ah. an axe, I guess, in this way we think about it. Okay, so okay. that's a great that's a great question. Okay. Take, yeah, please, Kel, please. Okay. Mm -hmm. In Italian, it's adza, which mm -hmm. is two zads, a z z a, which which means axe, and the term pole axe, p o l l, not p o l e, like a like a a punting pole or. or pole vaulting it's p-o-l-l -L in english which means head and it's not about the head of the axe itself it's about what it crushes uh, a pole a pulling axe or a pulling hammer in english culture especially in agriculture is the uh, the big hammer that they killed livestock with they didn't stab livestock because they wanted to conserve the blood and they needed food right so what they would do is take a big hammer and completely stun the animal uh, by smacking it in the head. And that's the way things like that were done for centuries. Um, you know, people think you know, they, they cut their heads off like they do with chickens. Well, no, um, the, the blood of, of a large animal is part of the food source that comes out of that animal. And nothing is to be wasted because they, you can't afford it you know, after having raised the animal. That for that long. Now, however bad that may sound, modern people, uh, medieval people, were perfectly in tune with the environment and the food that they ate because a lot of times they hunted it. If they didn't raise it themselves, they hunted it. And noble people uh, spend an awful lot of time hunting large, dangerous animals, both as training and to, to help out the local farmers whose crops were being destroyed. Um, like a wild boar and a few sows and piglets can destroy a grain field in no time in literally a few hours um, it's a big problem even today in many of the southern states for you know wild boar populations anyways getting back to the, the pole bit the idea of pole axe is a general purpose term but a more appropriate term is pole arm something that's got a head on it and there's all sorts of head shapes in uh, the getty the axes are all of the form the french form bec de corbin or falcon's beak the uh, the, the head face or the hammer face is generally four points or sometimes three points. Uh, they tend to be just drifted out in, in their rough form uh, with a couple of chisel blows. Um, the back of it or the fluke, some people like to call it, that's the raven's beak. And it's a, uh, a reinforced hook with sometimes a sharpened edge on the back on the inside of the curve, but very strong uh, piercing weapon. It can bite right through nail without any trouble at all. So if you swing that down and catch somebody mm -hmm. just inside of the shoulder plate, you're going to really destroy their arm. Mm -hmm. Whereas the hammerhead can destroy things through the thinnest parts of the plate. Mm -hmm. But generally, the top, like the frontal lobe of a helmet or middle of a breastplate, can withstand at least one or two shots from the head. Now, the lance tip is just as much uh, mm -hmm. strong and sharp as any other lance but not as long they're mm -hmm. very short and and mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're called a dag mm -hmm. most, in most things um, and again to counterbalance that weight on one side on the other side the uh, mount iron fitting sometimes with a spike as it's shown here uh, but quite often just two bands uh, like a u-shape two u-shapes uh, crisscrossed at 90 degrees and then rivet onto the foot and in italian calc calc is the foot of, of the axe uh, in French is Q uh, or tail and uh, the head is called the male in French in, in, in Italian they don't have a they don't seem to have a specific word for a given head they just call them axes uh, so um, it's not about the staff that the, the furniture is mounted on it's about mm. what the thing can be used for to crush heads yeah and though it's true that our culture has many um has has many different objects that fit the description axe right um i mean anybody who's a nerd which i'm sure is everyone here you know knows you know axes from you know battle axes hand axes great axes double bearded axes 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 you know there's all tons of all sorts of shit that our culture calls axes 
So, most of which, you know, most of it yeah. is generated in the Victorian age. Yeah, yeah. So forget so about that. Love to classify everything. Yeah, you know, we're not talking about any of those things, real or fake, though they may be. This thing, Fiore calls Azza, and that's what we're talking about. This is the axe, as Fiore describes the Azza, without qualification. But it's this thing that Kel described. That's the thing we're talking about. Um, um, there's yeah. a, if, if, if any of you are very curious about the very, uh, numerous types of medieval to early Renaissance pole arms, uh, with the different types of shapes of head and regional variations and things like that, um, you, you should get a, your hands on a PDF of a book call, called um, Hafted Weapons of the Middle Ages. And that's by a fellow named Waldeman, W-A-L-D-E-M-A-N. Oh, 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 hold on, Kel, hold on, Kel. Um, hafted Weapons, uh, I'm just typing in the chat. Hafted well, I can, weapons. Put, I can put the PDF, I've, I've offered to put up the PDF. Oh, of, uh, that'd be great. A few things, a few things. that one, uh, it, I, I just got it off the internet, it was pretty easy to find. Okay, but, sweet. Um, I can put up stuff. There's a short list of things I'm supposed to be putting up on this forum, but... Sweet. Yeah, you, you can just upload it right to the chat, the general chat, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, uh, well, I was going to put it on the Emma uh, library because uh, okay, every Emma student can go to the Emma library for free. And I like to keep uh, uh, copyrighted material that we, we put up as, as if it were an internal library. So right. we, can't, we can't get harassed about copyright infringement if we have it in a closed library. Mm -hmm. So, uh, sure. anyways, for those anyways. of you that, that, that want to go hunting for it, uh, Half the Weapon of the Middle Ages by, I believe, Peter Baldwin, or Kurt Baldwin, which is Baldwin for sure. And uh, it's a, a really cool book because it goes right into x-rays of the heads and how the how the, uh, the heads were mounted and whatnot. It's just very good stuff. Awesome. Uh, okay, any questions? Guys? Yeah, any questions before that? Mm -hmm. I just took a follow-up. Um, mm -hmm. Sure. So... Is a poleaxe the same as a halberd? Um, I don't think it, it, a halberd so and a poleaxe are, are both hafted weapons. Yeah, yeah. It's the easiest way to describe it in, in modern sort of uh, in, you know museum curator terms. Mm. Uh, in, in armor discussions and for people that collect arms and armor, those are the sort of words you use. The, the term halberd mm. uh, is tends to be used for a specific head configuration mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. has a cutting a cutting edge face and either a smaller cutting edge or a, mm -hmm. or a beak on the back um, but these terms are also used indiscriminately i mean it's just crazy how how the terms are tossed around wildly mm -hmm. and people call to well that's a vouge and that's a partisan and that's a whatever whatever yeah yeah, yeah um, whatever Partisans are described in great detail in Italian works, uh, so we know what, what kind of things they expected a partisan to be, but a Vulge is never described in any way other than, well, we've got 37 Vulges in the armory. You right, know, like that's, right. That's the limit of it, so if that helps uh, answer your question. Yep, thank you. Yep. Hey, but again, like, we're talking about these like long, hafted weapons, like the kind. Yeah, that's, that's basically right. Basically something that's okay. a, you know, a nasty on a stick. Yep. The best way to describe any sort of half. Yeah, though though it should be noted that um, they're not they're not really that long, right? Um, the halberds that we just saw, the, or the quote unquote halberds, those were like, you know, six feet. More. Seven, you know, eight. seven eight feet. Right. These are, what five? Maybe. Um, they can be. They tend to go up to a, a shoulder height of an average man. Yeah. Both most uh, other art of the period of, of the Getty, uh, there's quite a bit of different things. There's one of St. not George, uh, Michael. Mm. Uh, an illumination of, of Michael with flowing blonde hair and a white white tower with gilt all over it and whatnot. And he's standing with a back to, uh, Cor uh, mm. back to Corbin that's literally shoulder high with him and he's leaning one hand on it. Hmm. Uh, like he, he's leaning on it as if it's a staff mm -hmm. and uh, it perfectly shows what an Italian of this period expected hmm. somebody important to be armed with and what it, how big it would be and mm -hmm. those sorts of things. The thing about something that's very, very long 
because it's difficult to defend yourself at close range. Mm -hmm. Something that's that's uh, like shoulder height or so mm -hmm. can be easily maneuvered wrestling range without any trouble at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, people ask, have asked me many times over the years, you know, what's your favorite weapon? Do you, you really like the axe or whatever? And I said, well, it's true, I do, but I would just as soon have a 12th century or 13th century um, spata, which is a, a Irish axe of a particular shape than I would a, a pole axe like this because the spata can be used to slice and dice and, and crush and poke and thrust. And it's the heavy blade doing it. There's no points to be broken off or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they typically had um, an oak with an ash shaft. So, I mean, in itself, it's a very heavy weapon. And it was typically used by someone who had very, very light armor, if any at all, um, the kern. And anyways, that's prefer my preference in axes because it can do the sorts of things that I like to do to people in armor. Whereas the Bec de Corbin has uh, a lot of things that can get tangled up. A real yeah. steel one, uh, which you can see on the rack at, at MH Toronto whenever mm -hmm. it comes back. Uh, I have the other of that pair, and it's really small. It's mm -hmm. tiny. It it's not that big. Survive. No, it would never survive real combat. The head's pretty nice. Mm -hmm. Like it's a really good shape and, and size and whatnot. But uh, the whole axe itself is too small. It needs to be at least 50 percent thicker half yeah it. um and then of course the, the the foot on the bottom of it and then you've got a weapon you can really destroy things with yeah now, these ones are like, this is a this is, these are a decent example like do you see you no, can see they're is. not that long you know maybe they're a little big but they're not that long no, at all no 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 they're not well, yeah. matt and i worked on those matt did yeah. the casting mm -hmm. he got the rubber and cast the heads based on our old valentine ones that every single shaft broke Mm -hmm. So I helped uh, Matt select the wood for these, and he and a friend cast the head directly onto the wood. They cannot be taken off. So if one of these halves breaks, that hex is done. Mm -hmm. uh, can't be repaired. Well, the, uh, they're pretty sturdy. The pictures, they're pretty sturdy. Pretty sturdy. Yeah, repaired, like, so we've got a couple of minor splinters on one or two of them, and I've repaired them with a little bit of file and sand, or mm -hmm. not file, but rasp and sandpaper. Mm -hmm. And they're, you know, they're made out of decent quality ash, so they're not horrifically heavy. But uh, it'd be nice if we could put some uh, rubber feet on it. But yeah, it would, yeah. It, it's not really going to happen because the casting rubber is so expensive. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe who knows. <clears throat> um, but yeah, okay. So um, that's kind of the context for the axe. Does anybody have any last questions before we start looking at the posters? Um, okay. All right, great. Cool. Let's get into it. So, uh, as is co common, we're used to this by now, the axe section is going to follow the typical, uh, formula of guards and then plays. So let's get into the guards. The guards we see, we have one, two, three, four, five, six guards. And, uh, the first one is short serpent. So Folio 35 VA. Um, Alex, would you like to read this one for us? I'm posta breve la serpentina. And I consider myself better than the other guards. Take one of my thrusts and you'll definitely bear the mark. This point is very strong and can penetrate breastplates and placards. Come on, defend yourself and let's try it. <laughs> All right. Um... Pretty simple, I think. Uh, we were familiar with this post already. There's not really much more to be said, um, but emphasize what Fiore says himself, which is, I consider myself better than the others. I'm never sure whether or not to take this as Fiore's word or some like anthropomorphization of the post is. I don't know. It's probably, it's probably Fiore saying he thinks it's good. So, okay, fine. Um, take one of my thrusts would definitely bear the mark. The point is very strong. Well, sure. That's all. That stands to reason. Short serpent. There you go. The points right there. You can bury that into the the weak points. Great. Um, um, I got a. There's one problem here. Uh, mm -hmm. In the Italian, mm -hmm. it doesn't specifically say breastplates and um, hmm. placards. Because the placard had yet to be invented in this period. Coraze e pan, pancheroni. Yeah. Que punta si e forte pur passare coraza e panzerone. Panzerone yeah. is 
a male shirt or skirt, mm. something to protect the belly mm. uh, specifically. Coraza is cuirasses, mm. is, 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 is not necessarily a breastplate. Mm. It is, is something, a, an armor assembly, mm -hmm. we would call a pair of plates. In this period, certainly a strong frontal breast, a single breastplate was common, um, but there's a joint between the, the breastplate, the single breastplate, and you can't see it because he's got an army coat on. Uh, there's a there's a joint between where the breastplate ends and the uh, uh, covering mm. of the lower like below the short ribs. Breastplate mm -hmm. ends at the short ribs, and from there to just below the hip joint is covered with either a male fold or a, mm. a fold assembly of plates. Now, if you go back to the video you had with Matt uh, Matt Brundle and, and there, uh, you'll notice that Matt Brundle's got a plate fold. Well, I actually made it for him. Uh, there you go. And it's a, a series of horizontal hoops, and it covers down to his uh, his uh, little jewels. Um, he, he wanted it specifically that way. Very few of them in period were like that, although there are examples of them. Hmm. So, I mean, it's really good protection, but it is flexible. Mm -hmm. A heavy spear, uh, a heavy spear, or point thrust with a pole axe can breach those plates. So this is what we're talking about. Yeah. And, and the, to use the term uh, uh, placard, placard is a solid plate mm. that goes below the breastplate, and they just didn't exist yet. Mm. So I just want to qualify that's great. that. That's great. That's great context. Yeah, and it, it, and if it can pierce, you know, these, these um, uh, articulated plates, then all the more it can pierce any kind of male fold exactly. that's going to be there. Um, so so yeah um the short serpent great for great for thrusting great for thrusting and strong so moving on vera croce folio 35 vb um andrew sir would you like to read the text for us Oh, here we go. Um, I am the post of the Vera Croce since I defend myself with the cross. The whole art of fencing and of arms features the defense of the cross. Go ahead and attack. I'm waiting for you. With my axe, I can perform the same thrust with a pass as the first student of the Remedy Master of the Sword and Armor. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, cool. So, here we go. Um, true cross we have with the thumb facing in in the photo yep. that's correct yep. right yeah yeah oh no 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 the thumbs are both this thumb is out they're, this thumb is in right but they're both facing in the same direction facing towards the, the foot yeah 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 okay right. great this is really a lot more like bastard cross position mm -hmm. uh in terms of the the stance and and the uh mm -hmm. provocation and whatnot um the thing is, making Sotano with a poleaxe head rising is just an ugly, ugly mm. thing to defend against. It's so difficult to deflect, and it's going to hit you under your arms or under your wrists if you're lucky. And if it comes up into your uh, inside of your leg, you're going to die because your uh, femoral artery will be smashed. Mm. Um, Leg harness in this period generally did not enclose the thigh. Mm. It was uh, usually some kind of n nail or padding mm. uh, on the inside of the thigh mm -hmm. because it's it's hard to ride. Mm -hmm. So I've been told by someone as eminent as Toby Capwell, he, he says if the plate fits you really well and your saddle is built really well built, like correctly well built, mm. then you can sort of feel the horse. Mm. But he says without that, you can't feel what the horse is doing. You know, like you, you're not as tuned to the horse as when you have your actual inside of your thigh, something flexible, mm -hmm. getting pressure back from the saddle and from the reactions of the horse. Um, and, you know, Dr. Capwell is, is one of the world-class jousters. The queen her, herself uh, gave him some sort of medieval-esque prize for winning so many tournaments and bringing the art of jousting back. 
He also happens to be the curator of arms and armor at the Wallace Collection in London. Mm -hmm. He's an absolutely terrific uh, fellow, and I'll take his word in any case about armoring yep. horses. As will I. So that's what I would learn. Um, so uh, since I defend myself with the cross, the whole art of fencing and of arms features the defense of the cross. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I think this is very typical of Fiore, that he throws in these bombs, these like these pedagogical bombs, just kind of tucks in, tucks them into random plays. Um, yeah. We talked about the cross, you know, the art of fencing, and on the engagement. That's kind of my word. What he's when he says cross here, he means the engagement of the of the enemy's weapon, right? That moment when your weapon engages theirs. Right, he, the whole art of fencing. He's very s explicit, and of arms features the defense of the cross. So, um, all the things we said about that in the sword and, and two hand section, he's kind of repeating here, right? He's doubling down or further clarifying. So, isn't that great? Uh, maybe then the scholar session will unpack this more. Who knows? Um, go ahead and attack. I'm waiting for you with my axe. I can perform the same thrust with uh, with a pass as the first student of the Remedy Master of the Sword and Armor. So let's check it out. The first student. So here we go. Folio 33RD is what he seems to be referring to. And that is what he's suggesting. So cool. Great. You can do that. Same play. Same play. And that, that stands to reason. That should be intuitive to us, I would imagine. Um, okay, there we go. Any last questions about this one? Uh, yeah, I just have one question. So it's the same play, but the thumbs are facing the opposite direction? Uh, do, yeah. Yeah, you can do this play with your thumbs in, your thumbs forward. Um, uh, in, the, in the case of the sword... In true cross mm. it's back weighted which is gives it a different sort of momentum mm -hmm. but an axe by itself has enough uh, momentum to really mess somebody up compared to what a long sword can do even a heavy specialized long sword for terminal use um, it's not as critical uh, i think i've said it a few times if you have your lead thumb pointed at your target you can acquire the target more accurately if you have your thumb uh, facing in and you're working with the back of your wrist you have mechanical advantage that you don't have with your thumb forward but you lose accuracy right so, so the it can be it can be used either way yeah. what i'm saying what i'm saying is it, it shows it a particular way mm -hmm. and uh and in the Getty, it shows the hand positions in the first scholar that we were just discussing. The hand position is a thumb point forward, but when he comes up and he's making it, and the, and the, the remedy master is making his cover, his thumbs are both hands. And in all the other uh, manuscripts, all four of them, or uh, the other three, I should say, um, the thumbs are all forward. It's it's hmm. it's not. It's not a hard and fast rule, black and white, and, and the, really the difference is point control. And uh, with a poleaxe, you know, point control is important, but when you're going to uh, intending to turn this thing over and smash them with the other side of it anyways, point mm. control is not really that important. Mm. Does that make mm. sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is an excellent question, though, because mm -hmm. when you look at it, you know, that's an inconsistency, right? But when you play it out, it just it's just a matter of do you want to put your point on accurately or do you mm -hmm. want to have more leverage and you know and these are also the things um that <clears throat> uh these are the kind of observations that you made graham that we encourage students to make because Absolutely. you know there's nothing in the text that said you must have your thumbs this way or that way here or elsewhere right we we've explained um we think we've we've we have a scholarly explanation for why the art in the in the drawing is the way it is we think we know why it works the way it works but experimenting with different hand positions is a great thing right um so so again right uh, 
this stuff that we're telling you, uh, it, this isn't the gospel according to Kel and, and, and Aaron. This is, you know, trying to understand a primary source from which our study begins, right? If I can add something to that, mm -hmm. if you, you individually, or, you know, another time, go back and watch whatever Polak's fights you can find on the Emma channel. And there are lots of them. Mm. Um, you'll see that the axes change hand position and size very, very frequently, mm -hmm. as, much or, uh, as much so as with the sword. Because we're constantly testing the, 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 the guard we're facing, right? We're constantly mm -hmm. offering provocations. With a pole axe, it doesn't happen as fast as it does with a sword, but it, it happens with a lot more authority. So someone who ignores a threat is tending to pay. They're going to pay. Yep. With a sword, you might get away with a, a void or, or mm. a bare cover deflection. <laughs> with a pole axe... Man, you make nope. a mistake. There's a price. Yeah, you're not getting away with anything. <clears throat> yeah. And if you, you know, if, if you ever get annoyed at your instructors uh, yelling at you about um, this uh, silly thing you're doing, this sloppy thing you're doing, you know, just think of it this way: we're trying to make sure that you don't train to get away with things, so that when you start to do the axe. <laughs> you don't get killed. <laughs> not, even, not even so much that. When you get to the point of free fencing, um, really sloppiness in doing your posters is going to do you a massive disservice because if you're not comfortable flowing yeah. all the way into a poster and you end up stuck in between, we call that poster mortal. Yeah. <laughs> okay? yeah. You get your hands chewed up and the number of... Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Po uh, not possible, prevent uh, uh, potential scholars that get so badly injured in the uh, beginning of fencing phase because they don't get their hands and arms out of the way. Hands are easily broken. And uh, yep. if you tend to block with your hands instead of using the weapon like you're supposed to, like almost all SCA people do, it's, it, they have to wear enormous gauntlets like ground out on the weapon as part of the rules of fighting simply because so many of them don't know how to use their weapon to defend themselves. They only know how, basically how to use it in offense. I've seen people fight with pole axes that, you know, I wouldn't let them chop wood. They have no coordination. <laughs> it's brutal. Anyway, sorry, not just hacking on the SCA, but there are very easy, there's a bazillion uh, videos of them fighting out there. So when you mm -hmm. watch them, mm -hmm. they've got these huge gauntlets and they're smashing on each other. Well, they'll stick their hands into the middle of a blow. It's crazy. Yeah. <clears throat> you won't, wouldn't get away with that with a real pole axe, that's for sure. No, no, no. That's for sure. Um, okay. All right. Next posta. Posta di Donna. Whoa. This is a new posta. Folio 35 VC. Uh, BD, sir, would you like to read this for us? Posta di Donna, and I oppose the Denti di Shingaro. If the Denti di Shingaro waits for me, I can make a powerful strike by performing an offline accrescimento with the left, passing and entering with the fendente to his head. And if the opponent forcefully places his axe under mine, making it impossible for me to strike his head, I can target his arms or hands. Thank you very, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you very much, Beatty. All right. So, um, Posta di Dona, it opposes Dente di Cingaro, a boar's tooth. So, something interesting to note. Um, <clears throat> I wonder how easily this is going to... Hmm. Okay. Well, you'll have to take my word for it. I'm pretty sure that in the manuscript... Yeah, 35... Oh, the VB. Oh, okay. I was just about to lie to you. Good thing. I stopped myself. So, for some reason... These two posts here have the red labeling. And they're not, um, yes, they're set, I, I, the A and B. So they are set uh, opposed to each other, but they don't actually talk about each other. Whereas these um, la, these next two pairs, Didona, um, Metzana, Lunga, and, oh, what's it? Metzana? This is, shouldn't this be, shouldn't this be Dente Di Cingaro? In the, or in did the, I mislabel it? In the, in the PD, it's Dente Di Cingaro. Ah, oh, okay, because he opposes that. Yeah, that's I what can, I thought. Uh, 
Andrew Jackson. Mm -hmm. um, this particular pairing is incredibly crucial to understanding mm. the guards of the sword. When uh, you look at the guard middle iron gate or um, full board's tooth in the sword in two hands before the armored section, it faces off against close to Didana. Mm -hmm. And the reason being is there are specific defenses, and the defenses are not talked about in the sword section, but they're talked about here in the poleaxe section. There's very clear detail on how these things mm -hmm. work and why they work against each other. So it's, this is a section that is not often read or understood, mm -hmm. but is utterly critical to the basic use of the sword. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And when Fury says, you know, I oppose the other, right, in the posters, that's not uh, a dismissible fact, right? He he wants to make he wants to indicate. I would submit uh, to you that he wants to indicate that there's an important relationship between um, yeah. the, the the two posters paired. So I oppose the Didona. I oppose um, Dente Tichingaro. If Boris Tooth waits for me, I can make a powerful strike by passing with the left foot, stepping offline and giving a, a fidente to his head. If the opponent comes forcefully with his axe under mine, um, I read this as... Um, um, uh, where, 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 where are we going to be here? Coming up, hey. Oh, okay. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay, so I was going to say, I, I was going to say, I was going to read it more as like a, uh, like a, like a true, like a true cross cover from the sword in two hands, but, but, uh, Okay. Okay. So, all right. So th uh, uh, that's fine then. So, if the opponent comes forcefully with his axe under mine, specifically uh, um, with a Sotani defense, so a, as it were, a false edge, um, uh, a false edge blow from underneath. Excuse me. This is this false is edge exactly, blow from underneath. Exactly what is described. In Dante Tijicaro Puta. Right. Uh, mm. the, the play that he says, I've come up, come up from underneath, I'll either wreck your hands mm -hmm. or your arms, and then if you cover this, I will come back down with a pendente and begin again. Mm -hmm. There's no stepping involved. This particular play, if you step with it, it will bring you far too close. Because if somebody's swinging a blow at you with a pole axe, they already think you're in measure. If you step closer and try to cover it, you've shortened the time you have to cover it by coming closer to a blow that's coming to you anyways. And you also lose the leverage of using your legs and hips because your feet are now crossed compared to the pole axe. The pole axe will go on the opposite side of your body. You cannot get this lift from underneath. You cannot get this sotano underneath either a fendente or a mezzano rito blow from the axe. And it's this sotano blow that <clears throat> he's referring to to, 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 that, to that, that makes the cover. Yeah. And then you get a descending then you get a descending blow or a thrust afterwards with the pole axe. You can thrust to the face. Right. Or you can if you if you cover wide a bit and you just slam down a pendente. And this is why he calls it dente to jingado. In, in uh, the other one, he, he yeah. calls it middle iron gate. But oddly enough, middle iron gate also covers with a sotano. It does. Yeah, so, they're very they're very similar. It, it, yeah. 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 And and in this particular case, with the Ladonna, if you're giving a fendente and he comes up with the sotani, Fiori suggests... Um, that you can right. change your target to his arms or hands. Yeah. And that's that, that's a dick move, but it's awesome, right? Um, this is yeah. some, you know... Well, uh, like, way you're, if you don't, you're going to catch his axe in your face. Right, and when, when, I say, when I say it's a dick move, let me be a little more eloquent. This is a very subtle thing, and the actual mechanics of how to do this well are difficult. Right. If everybody could do this, then there'd be lots of fencing masters. But ch changing your intention after you've begun a blow is, is is tricky to do and not and not fuck up. But this is what he's talking about. Right. Beginning a blow, the opponent responds with a cover and you change your intention and target um, to to kind of pre counter it. Right. 
and and that that's cool. That's that's great. This is this is one of the reasons that you absolutely cannot be overcommitted with an axe. Yeah. Because it will exactly, break. exactly. Begins the axe section by describing the axe itself as ponderous, mortal, and cruel. Mm -hmm. But it can hurt somebody, can cause you injury if you use it poorly. And what he means by that, uh, very obviously, is that he used it sloppily. And you saw mm -hmm. in the fight with Matt and Max, or I'm sorry, Matt and, uh, and John, uh, John um, where Matt over, uh, over, <clears throat> uh, Tom, mm -hmm. over commits on a blow, mm -hmm. he was desperate to get his axe back into the play before John w wailed on it. Yeah, he uh, lost his salary test when he overcommitted. Yeah, yeah he, he lost it, yeah. exactly. So, yeah. uh, fortunately enough, I'd hit him so many times that he knew he could get get the heck out of the way. Uh, because dodging the first attack is, is really important. Being able to avoid. You just can't stand there and let your armor take it. It's too, it's too many hits. Especially against the Polacks. It's yeah, uh, it wear you down. It's yeah. Exhausting. It's like being punched or kicked in the chest. That definitely like exhausting. Yeah. 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 In any case, this particular set of texts that we're about to uh, embark on is absolutely critical to your understanding of how uh, Dente Tsugaro works with a sword or with an axe, the lance. So those of you that are interested in, in reading the material and practicing it, why we practice it a particular way, this is your answer right here, this long paragraph. All right. I'm excited. Folio 35VD. I'm also excited, by the way, that we're actually getting into the mounted section. It's not that I'm really I'm, I'm just really glad that we're here and we actually made it through to the armored section. This stuff, even, you know, for myself, this stuff I look at far, far, far less um, than the first half of the book, Pr principally because we don't really teach from it, right? Most of the time I'm teaching, I'm reflecting on the stuff in the first half, not the second half. So it's just a joy to it's just a joy to look at this stuff. It's so cool. I'll read this. Um, one oh, all right, Kel. Sure. Um, here we go. Okay. If a posta di donna opposes me, the porta di ferro mezzana, I know both her play and mine, for we have faced one another. Many times before, sword <laughs> or axe in hand. Ah, in there it is. There it is. Mm -hmm. And here's, I think, everything she says she can do to me, I can do to her in spades. I also think that if I had a sword instead of an axe, I would give the opponent a thrust to the face while he attacks from Posta di Donna with a fendente, as I am in Porto de Ferro Mezzana with the sword in both hands. I, as I'm putting, sort of both hands, mm. I would perform an accrescimento and pass offline under his axe, literally to your left. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Enter forcefully and quickly, grasp my sword at mid blade with my left hand, and give him a thrust to the face. The first scholar of the sword in armor. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Between us two guards, there's little to choose from except in the group. So here's a <laughs> what story. a great paragraph. Oh man. This is this is one of the best and most instructive post the descriptions yeah. in the entire work. Because this goes all the way back to what is Porta de Ferro. What does it do? Why is it low? Because those of you that are fans of movies like uh, Oh, Kingdom of Heaven. Kingdom of Heaven. Oh, God. Where, uh, you know, it hurt my feelings so that badly when uh, when Liam Neeson goes into <laughs> post the post of the Falcone and, uh, and he says, never take a low guard. Like, what are you talking uh, about? Who wrote this? Uh, uh, this Ridley Scott. Uh, so badly. Yeah, well, guy. That, that in the scene where a German teaches Arabic, mm -hmm. they go, mm -hmm. well, that was so dense. Anyway. Oh, man. Um, so, anyway, for those of you who are uh, studying this material, you can do nothing. Even if you never pick up a Polax in your life, you can do nothing better than to learn these two uh, descriptions of these posters because there's so much information here about how to face the two most common attacks. 
an yeah. attack from posted Adana is universal. Even someone that has no training mm -hmm. will take up posted Adana with a weapon in two hands. Mm -hmm. Very few people will take up a low guard with two hands because it's an art as opposed to just a way to hurt something or chop something. Because if you're only used to manual labor, you're always going to be uh, going up and down. You're going to be down to cut wood. You're going to be down cutting, uh, chopping down to hack weeds. You're going to be chopping down to break clumps of soil after the plow has been gone through the field. So untutored people will naturally use a high guard and a descending blow. And that's why they're called natural guards in, in mm. many of the later land uh, manuscripts. The unnatural or, or eruptive guards uh, from below are the measure of every true guard. They are great. That is that is the, that is a fact. <laughs> um, so if I can mm -hmm. interject, please, Bruce. With a, with a small philosophical aside. Okay. Uh, philosophically natural was when things fell towards earth and unnatural was when things went up from the earth ha. absolutely so there you go in the in the philosophical works they discuss exactly natural that. forces yeah. well this is uh, this is Aristotelian physics right i'm sure there's some there's some of that in here floating around no I mean, if you if you read physics section 7 and section 8 from aristotle these comments are there. So that's why medieval philosophers found it that way because they followed the, the ancients, the classical philosophers. They did. Yes, the they did. And then all of a sudden Europe gave them up. God knows why. Um, all right. <laughs> Some English guy can hit by an apple or something. Right? I'd love to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trigger myself. Uh, okay. So, <laughs> um, can, post. Can I ask a quick yeah, question? please. Yeah, yep, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, again, um, I, I wasn't fully sure. So the previous post, the, the post that I was talking about mm -hmm. opposition to boar's tooth, mm -hmm. and you were saying that, the, the, like, depending on the manuscript, this uh, fourth post is named differently. Yeah, let's let us let us look at that. Let's look at that with a click. So here is the same posta in. Uh, it's not in the Morgan. I don't think there's Polex in the Morgan. Um, but here it is in the PD and the Paris. So in the PD, what do we got? In the PD, we have, I am the boar's tusk, full of daring. Blows of the axe can do nothing to me. So it's boar's tooth in the PD. And the Paris, who cares? <laughs> in the Paris, um, Dena primus horridus audax. I am the strong boar's tooth. A primus ego sum. And horribly daring, yeah. So it's the boar's tooth in the Paris and in the PD, but in the Getty, for some reason, even though in the text just previous, here's a little technical or a, a textual uh, uh, a, a gummy to chew on. In the text just previous, he says Posta di Dona opposes boar's tooth. Here he says it's middle Porta de Ferro, Porta de Ferro Mazzana. Ah, uh, I don't know. What do you want? We're just reading. We're just reading it. Okay. There is a slight difference if you look at the the Novati or PD, mm -hmm. and you look at the the, uh, the Getty. The way he's cradled the Polax haft under his elbow to stabilize it in the Getty versus the forearm and hmm. um, rear arm relatively extended in the Pisani Dazi. Um, it, it is a slightly different position. And quite frankly, they work exactly the same with the pole axe, and, and you can make them work the same with a uh, longer longsword. If mm. you have a short longsword, uh, middle iron gate doesn't work very well. Uh, Boar's tooth works just great, mm. just great, regardless of the length of the sword. Um, yeah, and uh, um, what else is there to say? <clears throat> so... Rather than go through all this text again, um, let's let's reflect on why these two are intimate partners here by simply looking at the mechanic, right? When post didona comes down, it this post didona is held high on the right. Once it passes post longa, its natural trajectory is to go low to the left. And low on the left is where Boar's Tooth is. So Ladonna on the right and Boar's Tooth on the left 
are, you know, two sides of the same coin, right? And Fury says it himself, there's really nothing different between the two other than uh, trickery, right? There's not a lot of difference between the two other than a, a trickery, which is added um, okay, by the... Gonna, I don't necessarily agree with that. He, he, he says between Asgard, there's little to choose from. Well, it's it's that either one of them, whoever does it first is with the mostest type of thing. Sure, uh, sure. They, yeah. they play against each other so often, it's whoever does it first and or who has the better trickery, the better. Um, They're similar. You know, just, yeah. But they, they are the op in terms of the, the opposites of each other. They oppose each other very clearly. Yeah. If you know one will know the other yeah either way you can have an advantage if you go first but there's 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 no real strong advantage uh just saying this guard's going to beat that guard every time because that's doesn't right work that way that's right so that's where i disagree with you there uh that's right okay <clears throat> and and uh, lastly uh to kind of piggyback on something that kel said earlier um god forbid for just studying the sword we only read the sword section you know, he, he gives he gives a whole description of a play with the sword in hand in the axe section, right? So Fury is a bit, um, at least it uh, uh, visually to us, he's he can be a bit disorganized in this sense, or it could be pedagogical. Maybe he's trying to te teach us something, right? Really pedagogical. I, I I would agree. I would agree with that. Um, he, see, he seems like he's trying to teach us something. Sword and the axe, axe and the sword, et cetera, et cetera. We've talked about it a million times. Um, yeah. Yeah, it depends on, you know, in, in a case like this, if you have a pole axe in the field on foot as an Italian, you're probably fighting a duel because Italians typically didn't use pole axes. They didn't go into foot combat if they could possibly avoid it. They almost always fought on horseback. So the pole axe was a specific thing that you had to deal with in a tournament or a deed of arms or something like that. So in, in some ways, people's argument that all oh, this is a dueling art, very specifically, if they only look at this mm. section, they're about 50% right. But if you have a sword instead, mm. this is a battlefield. If yeah. this is a tournament, if, if you're fighting two mm -hmm. particular terms, like uh, one of the terms that uh, the Mantova fought the Busico, uh, uh with in one of the deeds was three passes with lance, mm -hmm. three passes with uh, pole axe, and the lances were specified to be hard, sharpened lances, like a hard iron, a sharpened lance. The pole axes, of course, there's no way to make a safe pole axe. No. It's not possible. And the last pass was, I believe, with daggers, which they never got to. <laughs> Thank the God. Axe, and that was the end of it. Wow. Right? Um, this this particular thing is, is specified in all sorts of deals, like, like, like a WMA or MMA fight beforehand. They have all the rules are specified. The weight yeah. la, the classes, all the details of how the preparation has to be and all this kind of stuff very specific stuff whereas civil disturbances if you had decent armor and a pole axe why would you walk out with a sword like it's just crazy yep you, pole axe will do have, if you know you're going to have to wade through a crowd of people some of whom are going to have armor or great big shields like great big shields were a problem something called a pavis is a shield that's almost as big as a Roman scutum, so it covers almost the entire body up to the eye lines. Uh, if you have to deal with people like that, a sword's not going to do it. A lance is not going to do it, but a pole axe is going to do just fine. That'll uh, do. Another, another, yeah, exactly. Another thing, in, if you end up on a battlefield, uh, as the French found, if you have to go on foot because you know the English archers are going to murder your horses, and there will, you know, just be out of control chaos. You decide to go on foot in your heavy armor. You're going to carry a lance. You might carry a pole axe. But if you have a choice, you'll carry a lance because it's a much more agile weapon. And you'll also have a sword for backup. If you walk into battle with a pole axe and you have a sword, you got a lot of stuff that can get tangled up compared to a lance because the lance pretty much stays on the right side of your body and your sword is on the left side of your body. The pole axe, the thing's all over the place. 
and you don't have a lot of room to swing it in a press. Now, the English had a system of using the lance with two men. We don't know exactly, exactly how it works, but it might be that the lead guy was the thumbs pointed forward, the guidance system, and the rear guy was the power behind the shove, and they worked as a team together. Um, some people have, have sort of, you know, uh, claimed that, no, they just switched off with the lance, you know, the brake switched off. Well, you can have another team come up behind you just as easily and take the lance. And then uh, in a lot of descriptions of the fighting, especially the in initial charge at Agincourt, where the French made a three-step lunge, it was well known to the English that they did this. And the, and the vast majority of them took two steps back to take the impetus out of the rush. So the French literally tripped and fell over each other at the beginning of the battle. And this is documented in two out of the six uh, or so primary sources. So the whole idea that these people were just, you know, clubbing each other is just ludicrous. Even when you've got several thousand heavily armed men marching forward, they're going to use a lance because it's longer, even though it's not as long as it is on horseback. Compared to the reach of a pole axe, a lance has got a lot more going for it. And with a whole bunch of people in heavy armor, Lances are going to be a whole bunch of points forward. With pole axes, you got to have room to swing it. And when they press a man behind you, it's not going to be possible. A lot of a lot of people died in many of the major battles of the Hundred Years' War in the press of flesh, as opposed to by arrows or axes or, or whatever. They just simply got crushed. Uh, but there are too many people trying to be in the same space. In any case, with the pole axe in Fiore's work. He's showing you pole axe against pole axe, although he says the same thing works with a sword. And if I've got a sword and you've got a pole axe, this is what I'm going to do. It's it's very, very mm -hmm. instructive material and should not be skipped over as, well, I not we don't study that. You know, like we, don't, we, we don't get to fight in our, we don't practice with a pole axe, so I'm not going to spend any time on it. No, 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 no. We really need it, to read it's this in the stuff because there's a lot of material. That's crucial to understanding sword play mm -hmm. and fighting in general. Anyways, enough pontification. And on to the next posta, one that we're also familiar with from previous, Folio 36RA. Um, Bruce, would you like to read this one for us? <clears throat> uh, translations. I am the Coda Longa. Against a posta di finestra, I can strike at any time. One of my fendenti can beat any axe or sword to the ground, placing me in a strong position for close play. You will now see my player. You will now see my plays. Please be so kind as to examine them one by one. Thank you very Pay much, attention. Bruce. Yeah, we're almost at the plays, um, and some coming from fendente. So um, this is sort of him saying, uh, you know. Pay attention. Keep paying attention. I know you're tired. It's been a long book. Keep paying attention. The plays are coming. Um, a Coda Lunga. So this is um, tail on the right, the long tail. Um, on the right, we, we call um, the posta on the left, um, where the sword in one hand master is. We call this tail on the left as well. That's one of our Emma-isms. He doesn't have a a description for this poster, I, I believe. And he just calls it Kodalanga on horseback in the exact. That's same. right. Ah, yes, 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 yes. That's right. That 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 was the middle the middle place. So so you know we we at Emma we call all these tail. Um, there's you know some scholarly debate about whether or not the posta needs to be refused or not. We've kind of brushed by that in previous sessions. I won't discuss it uh, again. Um, in sword. It sort of is not necessary in axe. It actually is because of the longer weapon and the weight of the weapon. The uh, the arc to come through from posta de don, basically lifting it through posta de don to, to drop a fendente, yeah. is quite long. The arc to bring it forward through what we would with a sword would be uh, uh, to a, a full iron gate. Uh, this doesn't exist here with a pole axe. You can't, literally can't bring this thing low through those guards without widening your hands enormously and sliding it back again. 
which you can do with practice, but it's it's one of these things where he's describing a pendente, and from here, you want to be refused to cast a heavy pendente a long ways, because when you pivot forward onto your front foot, the left foot, um, you're throwing a 180 degree arc with a heavy, off-balance weapon. Um, that's that's uh, tent pegging at its finest. You know, yeah, it's like driving tent peg for the carnival. You know, and you're, I, you're just <clears throat> smashing this thing down. And as Kel said, it's going to come from a fendenti. So just because it's low, um, doesn't mean that it has to throw a sotani, right? Um, that's uh, I would hope, obviously not the case. Um, for any of the scholars on this, could be also evidence for our discussion about uh, if you can throw all cuts from all guards. We're just filing that away for later. Um, but here's a here's a case where he's in a low guard, and the follow uh, or the 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 attack that's going to come from it is going to be a fendenti, not a sotani. Uh, so question, but there that is. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's bringing the fendenti attacks in the context of a counter against Finestra, against the high guard. So he, like a um, high attack against the high guard. It's not not necessarily. So he is he is opposed in the book to post the Fenestra, that's true. And he can strike at any time, that's true. But he doesn't say that he would strike a Fenestra. All right? That's that's a leap of logic. It's now you know we can experiment with that, but he doesn't say in the text that this that you should you know you should throw a fendente here. This is the only in, thing you can do. He you know, doesn't say that. But he does say that he's faced off against a particular guard. He does. And, he does. And when we get to that guard, right. this will make more sense. Right. And we'll, we're going to move on there in, yeah, in let, just a let's moment. Not wag, let's not yeah. wag the tail before uh, the dog gets All right. Um, so, so hold on to that thought, uh, Alex. It's a okay? good question. Yeah. Very good question. You're about to be answered. Yeah. Anything else? This nope. is, okay. I'd just like to comment that this is a position, not, not, uh, oh. uh, Cota Longa. Hmm. Cota Longa is a position, if you take this with a pole axe, you literally can come out anywhere. If someone counters this with, uh, say, bastard cross with a sword, uh, you can make this blow by pivoting backwards. The force is still there because what makes this thing happen is the the body movement. This is not about just swinging the axe with your arm. You have to move your whole torso and your feet to make this thing work. If you simply do a fendente by volta stabile, then you're going to have a good hard blow, but very predictable. If you do this with a path back, even a small one, the, back of the forward foot, you can still strike a real heavy fendente against someone that's trying to cross with you, say from True Cross or from Bastard Cross. Um, there's so many tactical possibilities of this position exactly the same way that there are so many tactical possibilities of quarter longa e distesa in a sword and two hand section. It has very strong similarities, but you have a much more powerful weapon that's much more committed. So, having that said, I'm hoping that that, that primes you for the next one and why he says he opposes it. Yeah, all right. Posta di finestra, la sinestra, on the left. <clears throat> Folio 36RB. Um, who's up next? Uh, Connor, you want to give us a go? They call me Costa de Finestra, the right arm drawn. We have no stability. Each seek deception. You think I'll attack with a tent, but I pass back instead to guard. Well, I started to the left. I will enter to the right. And quickly for play. Now see. Thank you, Connor. All right. Posta di uh, Finestra on the left. Okay. So, 
Um, you might think uh, that this is seems like a counterintuitive posta uh, to hold with the axe, not least because the head is heavy. And why would you put the, you know, why would you hold your axe like this? But don't ask that question because save that question for the spear section. <laughs> because if you thought that was weird, <laughs> there's a uh, finestra in the spear section as uh, 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 as okay, as well. I'm going I'm, I'm to interject there that you cannot do the same movement with a pole axe as you can with a lance because of the weight disparity. Of course not. No, yeah, it's yeah. Counterbalance. Okay. But all that is to say that this isn't. This seems counterintuitive, but it's only because this is new to us. So okay. don't don't worry about it uh, uh, too much. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna expand on that. I'm sorry, I have mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. uh, because you're 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 just leaving them hanging. All right. Mm -hmm. This play, what he's suggesting is this is a provocation. And it's meant to draw you into throwing a heavy blow. If you throw a heavy fendente against this, which you would tend to do against a, a left finestra if you're a klutz, and you don't really understand what finestra is, or 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 flug, uh, pla, uh, not flug, uh, uh, aux in uh, the German system. If you don't really understand how it works, and you're trying to pound through it with strength. You're going to be sadly disappointed because the real element of this is not the axe itself, but the fact that the body moves under the axe, moves backwards and to the right. So the axe stays where it is and you move around it. Most people that haven't experienced or seen it find it impossible to believe mm -hmm. until they actually see it happen. And it is absolutely destructive whoever's throwing the pendente because they're throwing it into air mm -hmm. it might mac knock your axe to the ground but more likely it's just going to charge the axe and you can swing that thing around and give them back your own pendente from the right side because by switching feet and passing back a little bit and i'm not talking about a gigantic pass back i mean literally you're just changing feet right this whole thing comes to the right side of your body with some sort of thunderous blow chasing it and then you can do all sorts of horrible things to the person who has just gone whistling through the air it is a frighteningly efficient uh, movement but not one for a klutz you have to mm -hmm. be able to move like a dancer mm -hmm. so if your uh, training in armor is all about strength and stability and increasing your elephant so you can carry a castle for 12 men, then you're never going to be able to do this play. This is a, a play of dexterity and movement. And what he describes here is very straightforward. It's a simple deception. Mm -hmm. But most people can't find themselves into this position. The business about the right arm withdrawn is what really screws them up. Because when you do this with uh, a sword or with... Uh, a lance, your wrists are crossed, mm -hmm. or, or your, um, you're all along That's the right. side of your body. In this case, the axe, how, at least a third of the axe is in front of you, right? And it's not straightforward. It's not pointing straight forward. This thing's sloped across your body. If you try to take the stance as pictured here with the axe all on your left, you're not going to be comfortable for very, very long. You won't be able to hold this post. And as he says, it's unstable. It's not because the body's unstable, but because this is not something you can resist energy with. But instability doesn't mean weak. It means mutable. It means changing. It means constantly being where it's not expected. This is the problem with many people English understanding of stable and unstable. Instabile does not mean unstable. It means mutable, changeable in Italian. So when you chew on that for a bit, you see that this is this is like the Loki god of, of Asgard of Polak's uh, posta. This is Very tricky. constantly moving, tricky thing. Exactly that. I haven't even watched the first episode of that silly show yet. But I probably will. Anyway, this business here uh, 
I've found that many people over the years have tried to say, well, it's drawn wrong, or it's done this, or it's done that. I have no problem at all making this position and sucking people into throwing fundamentals at my head, which I then dodge because I'm moving. And I'm a big, heavy guy, and I have no trouble doing this. So any of you should be able to do it just fine. It's a good one. <clears throat> and it's also the last poster in the section. The poster, right. So does anybody have any questions um, about the... Uh, the collected so the, posters? Yeah, yeah, the fellow that had the question earlier. Oh, yeah, um, uh, that, that's does right. This, does this answer your question now? Does it make more sense? I'm sorry, I didn't catch who it was. It was Alex. Question. It was Alex who, Alex. who asked, okay. yeah. Alex? Yep. Yep, that you? makes sense. Yeah? Thank you. Great. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Um, oh, Bruce, one yes. One point mm -hmm. uh, about the last poster. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gathering from your discussion... Cal, that when you're saying you withdraw, the head ends up. You with you pull back, you step back with your right leg, the head of it ends up behind you. Correct? No. And the butt pointing forward? No. You leave all that business out in front of you. You step back out from under the axe. Mm -hmm. You leave the axe there in place. Because somebody that's trying to smash down on an axe and bash it into your head, right? They're trying to drive a fendente down through basically the where the the cross of the axe, um, or, or I like to use the French term, the, the mayor um, of the axe, is um, they're trying to smash that into your forehead. Well, when you remove everything of yourself and leave that thing forward, if they connect with it, they're going to plow through it and add energy to your your weapon and your movement. You're already um, making a vector, making a powerful vector backwards to your right. You're changing sides. So much like the villain strike with the sword in two hands. Yes, gathering that's their exactly energy, right. Gathering their energy and you can swing it around to a fendente from either side. Mm -hmm. And that's the nice thing about this. When you, when this thing gets swung down, you're going to sort of pass through Cotolonga, sort of, mm -hmm. and come up, and you can bring this thing down from your left or your right shoulder, mm -hmm. either way. And and you're talking temp peg. Mm -hmm. like temp that's that's going to be a powerful blow. It, yeah, because you've gathered energy from their blow and your body movement and redirected it with your hands. So your hands and arms are the guiding uh, system, and the energy is coming from a full body movement and hopefully some energy from their descending axe blow. Um, catching somebody with a blow like that because their axe is going to be down and they'll be struggling to pull it back up, if anything, you're just going to smoke them. Absolutely smoke mm -hmm. them. And that's, uh, you know, a very good op opportunity for a death, like murder, death, kill, as it were. I love that. I love that phrase. <laughs> Murder, Murder, death, kill. Yeah, that's uh, that's yeah. fury. Uh, did, did that? Um, I answer your question, Bruce. Bruce. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, I'm sorry. I'm still a little confused as to how the, the right arm stays forward if my right shoulder is moving backward. But I guess so I just have to wait and see. How the how the somebody right have arm to show stays me. forward. What's the, okay. it's, it's if the my axe. body is moved. Okay, okay. If, you, if, uh, if you look at this position and, uh, and the way that Aaron's got the arrows drawn, uh, if you are moving the right side of your body back, so now the left side of your body is forward, your left hand will be forward and your right hand will be on your right side. But okay. the pole axe itself, you you've swung around the pole axe. You've yeah. gone around the weapon. There's nothing underneath here. Yeah. Right. Just, there's there's just, nothing. You you evacuate that space. I don't yeah. know. You're old enough to remember Snagglepuss, right? Where he's always saying exit stage right or exit stage left. This is one of those uh -huh. moments. This is exit stage left. So you're you're disappearing your body from under the pole axe, creating a void. But you've still got a grip on the pole axe. And the best thing about it is while you do this, you can slide your left hand down towards the foot of the axe. So you increase 
your leverage on the axe receiving a blow that they thought was going to blast through because of your weak grip. So when you bring this around, now you've got this enormous amount of energy from both your body movement and from hopefully catching some of their axe uh, hmm. descending because I'm an offendente. As I say, I had, whoa, that was crazy. Um, that was as loud. I say, I have had many, many, many people over the years contest this because uh, discussing it in, in, you know, in, in words. And then when we go outside with a pole axe, they say, well, don't you want to put a mask on? And I say, no, I don't really need it. And I'll go and do this play. And I suggest they put a mask or a helmet on because if I can't pull the blow, if they hit too hard, then I'm not going to be able to control it. There's no way I'm going to get hit because I'm leaving. I'm, I'm the exit stage left, man. I'm gone. And the pole axe is the only thing that's still in that space. Yeah. Does, does that make any sense to you, Bruce? Because, I mean, it's it's difficult to visualize from word. But once yeah. you see it played out even once, it's just, it's a simple voice. It's really, really similar to the Coco de Viano. It is. Yeah. And it, it also involves, uh, Kel is do, I think you're doing a great job, Kel, in describing the actions. But uh, uh, unfortunately, the medium here that we're stuck exploring with yeah, is is with visual we need to you know we we need to be on the floor to really to really do it but we're talking about a skill here of moving around the weapon without moving the weapon right that's a very critical skill not least because when the weapon's engaged we want to be able to move around it without disrupting the engagement but also because uh, or even if the weapon isn't engaged, we want to be able to have it fixed in time and place and still be able to move around it if it's in the right spot. So this is partly what's going on here, and it's just one of those things we have to develop. Um, but I'm sure it's difficult to understand, or to, 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 not to understand, to describe um, by, by words, you know. Yeah. Literally, my... I, I think what yeah. I'll do tomorrow is get mm -hmm. a stick and, and work it out. Based on your descriptions, thanks. Get yeah. get get a broom. You know what? Get yeah. a broom and hold the the broom end of it in front of you like the uh, poleaxe head, because the broom is off balance that way. Yeah. Like a big heavy corn broom or yeah, or something a, like a, that. A yeah. Square push broom. It's mm -hmm. offhand. And when you mm -hmm. have this thing in front of you, find mm -hmm. it, finding finding the posta itself is so unnatural. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, Brian and I came to Guelph a, a couple of years ago. You know, he was teaching all kinds of different things, and he invited me out to join him to teach Polax. And he did his stuff on Polax. And when he got to this guard, he said, "Well, Kel's going to explain this to you, because Brian has never had any comfort with it because he doesn't like to play with Polax. His vision's not great. He's really good with any other weapons. He's, you know, he's got awesome interpretation skills." But the poleaxe was never one of his favorite things. And, well, it has been mine for like 40 years. So I'm very comfortable with all the different things you can do with a poleaxe, especially against a couple different people like at a time. So being able to dodge is a critical skill that we don't necessarily teach as well as we used to. Uh, when we were at the previous cell before we moved to DuPont, we had a scholar, uh, James Hobson, uh, who came up with this game that was all about voiding. So everything that you did to get points was about voiding and covering. Like if you, if you needed to use your sword to defend yourself, you got no points. But if you dodged and clearly covered the line, then you got a point. If you dodged, clearly covered the line and struck, as Silver would say, winning the place, you got two points, but if you ended up in a double kill or a bind or uh, missed everything entirely, like you got out of the way, but you couldn't do anything useful because you, you know, jumped out of range type of thing, then you lost a point. The important thing about losing a point is the mental stress it puts on most people. People hate to be down points. And when you can have negative points against you, you fight that much harder in the rules to get back even to zero. 
And it was an absolutely fabulous game. I wish I read, had a copy of, of the rules that James wrote out for us. We played it for several years, even once we moved to the new cell. But it's long since gone away. Nobody's been doing it. Yeah, I never ended up playing that one. I, I encourage it. Was, it's hmm. a little bit like Killer Spill, but there's almost no blade contact. Um, the, hmm. the, the point being, being able to read an attack is a critical skill. And you cannot develop that if your go-to action for every single attack is to make a crossing. A cover, as uh, Fiore describes, coverta. He uses the term coverta. He doesn't use parry ever. Tom, Tom uh, Leone's translations use parry because he doesn't understand single time uh, fighting. He's, uh, he's a renaissance fencer. Everything is parry repost, constantly parry repost. He does not comprehend it. If you have to go to parry repost in Fiore's system, you're already far down the chain. You're into plays that, well, I've got to do something because I could only make the crossing, right? A coverta is not a crossing. Incrasada is a crossing. Coverta is a cover. It means you can't be hit because you did something that makes you invulnerable to being hit. You have no access to a path to you. It's a really different thing. And we don't, unfortunately, stress it nearly enough in the last few years. I'm saddened by that. I try. But, of course, I can't remember enough of how that game worked to pass it on. I think every scholar should be learning that game. And most of us do eventually uh, learn to dodge blows. You know, like, it's good sucks getting hit. Who needs bruises if you don't have to have them? But the idea that everything has to be crossed is wrong. Coverta is not a crossing. And he has two different words for it. As I said before, Coverta is a cover. Incrosada is a crossing. And here we have a crossing of the axis. Yes, we do. Let's do um, let's do one, maybe two plays, and then we'll uh, as a taster for the the plays, and then that'll be our night. So, Folio thirty six VA. This is the first play of the in the plays of the axe. Um, Graham, would you like to read this one for us? Sure. Please, thank you. These are the plays through which these guards fight. Each guard wants to try them in the certainty of winning. If you can beat the opponent's axe to the ground as shown, all means do these plays. Do all the plays as long as the opponent does not stop you with a counter. Thanks, Fury. That really helps. Um, <laughs> what a pal, eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he just gets sassier as, he, as the book goes on. He's about to throw in his poison poleaxe plays and oh, shit. Yeah. Man, He's getting I tired. Love, I love the equestrian section, the stuff he has to say. Yeah, about. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fabulous. Fabulous. Um, all right, so... In this, okay, so let's let's take a bird's eye view of the plays. So, um, the the next uh, let me see here. Bah, 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 bah. The first two plays, uh, scholars that come, though notably there's no master. Um, uh, the first two scholars that follow from this play here, thirty six va, um, they follow from beating an axe to the ground. Then we have a stab to the face, we have a middle key, we have a, gra a grapple on the poleaxe, we have <laughs> where the, we have the the poleaxes have disappeared here. <laughs> we, have, we have two follow-ons to a grapple with the axe. Yeah, yeah. And then we have um, the, <laughs> the juice. We have some, some dirty tricks. Uh, yeah. So, first of I all... I know somebody mm -hmm. that made up a pair of those axes with the string. Oh, really? Oh, that'd be yeah, yeah. The one with the powder, he put talcum powder in it. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Even, and even with goggles on under the yeah. under the visor, yeah. the guy that got hit with it was choking and gagging. And oh, really? Had to stop. That's funny. He had to stop. He could not. We should, it. we should, it we should get some talcum powder. Yeah, yeah. The stinging nettle juice powder. Oh, yeah, man. I think the recipe is down here. I think that's the. Yeah, it is. That's the stinging nettle recipe. And yeah. Somebody, somebody found that in, also in a, a medicinal like a, a tacitum. They may have. Yeah. Like yeah. No, 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 hmm. no. Like somebody in the Fiore community. Oh. Found the actual recipe for this hmm. with a complete description of how to make stinging powder to defend a city gate. 
or oh, something okay. along those lines. So it's probably so something like that. that it, yeah. We know that it wasn't something Fury just dreamed up. Hmm. Like a lot of the mm-hmm. stuff we look mm-hmm. at in, say, Tallhoffer, mm-hmm. Tallhoffer stuff is pretty fanciful. Mm-hmm. Whereas neither of these things is particularly fanciful and, and, and can be, uh, you know, substantiated in other, yeah. other material. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, so uh, we're going to get to that stuff n- next week. I'm looking forward to that. Um, but just to, to understand this text here, um, these are the plays through which these guards fight. He doesn't specify which guards, so all the guards. All the guards want to try the plays that are going to follow. And, um, you know, certain to win with confidence, right? And then we have this thing. Okay, so we have some general comments first, and then we have this thing. And this play here, if you can beat the opponent's axe to the ground as shown, well, do it. Thanks, Fury. Um, and do the other plays as long as the opponent doesn't counter you. The other plays he's referring to, I would submit, are the uh, these two plays that follow. Um, all of these plays here don't follow from the first scholar these two do these uh, next ones obviously uh, n- not obviously so so uh, at least these two we know follow from this uh, 36 va the the argument that this stuff is all sequential um has some merit uh but as uh well, last last week uh, in the scholar section mm-hmm. Both of the provost and another free scholar joined us, mm-hmm. uh, and we That's were great. cracking. Of course, we were you know old guard, old old farts cracking jokes about all kinds of stuff. Mm. But experiences were you know a couple of the scholars managed to get to hear about actual fighting stuff in armor that they have yet to experience. This particular case of if you can get the pole axis to the ground, these are all the things you can do. Because you already know how to do apresare. Mm. You already know how to contain a weapon that's down. You already know how to poke somebody in the face. That how important it is. Because he showed you that in the sword section. The, he showed you the stepping on the, on the weapon in the sword in two hands. Mm. He showed this, this first scholar is one that he's never showed you, shown you anything like before. And you really enjoy it when we get to it next week. Mm-hmm. But um, the idea that these are circumstances that you can do if you can get the pole axes down is critical. Is if you can't get the pole axes down, you can't do any of this kind of stuff with any safety. Yeah, you and have to have yeah, control of the uh, uh, mm-hmm. Dory's weapon. You must control the weapon or him physically. Mm-hmm. And if he's got a weapon in his hands. Well, for example, the fourth plate here in this view, where you're poking the guy in the face, you lift the visor, poke him in the face. Well, we saw that in this, basically in the sword and uh, mm-hmm. armor section. But in this case, you he, you might have knocked it to the ground, and by letting it back go, he's trying to bring it back up to short serpent, but you jam him up in the face. Well, I can guarantee you that a pole axe in open visor is going to stop the fight. It's like, I'm sorry, that's that's the acne anvil of, uh, you know, of the cartoons. That's going right to suck. Here. Like, it's going to it's going to be done, done. No more. There will be no actions afterwards. You jam someone in the face with a poleaxe point in an unprotected, like, lift their visor and hit him. The fight is over. So yeah. it's a it's a good thing. But it, you also you cannot say just jam at him if you want to jam him in the throat or something while he's in low serpent because he's going to jam you in the guts or the nuts yeah right so this is not a safe place and if it were just simply a tournament where they were counted blows well you'd never lift his visor you just hit him in the visor and that would be your counted blow right so this is not a friendly encounter no. this is who trumps yeah right? this is to the end Mm. So uh, it's all really interesting, but contextual stuff. Yeah, and and just to just to add a final thought onto that, what Kel said is that we see, um, we saw in this fight here, 
let me talk over it while it's silent. Um, un unless the pole axe, uh, the, the pole axe of one fighter is pinned underneath the pole axe of another, they have freedom to be in Largo, right? Yeah. And the in the pole axe, lit, you know, is 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 perfect in Largo. Those blows can defeat armor, right? It can ha it can do straddle things that tr true, yeah. right? That's fine. But the pole axe defeats armor beautifully in Largo. So unless you're unless you're able to achieve that... the overbinding and get some control so that it allows you to come in to enter to Strato to do some things, you're going to have to fight at Largo and you're at risk, right? You're, you're at risk. Both of these fighters are at risk. If they fuck yeah. up at Largo, they're going to get domed with steel the, uh, heads, right? If you can back that, back that up yep. about 20 seconds or so. Oh, too much. Oh, too much. All right, here we go. Uh, at one point, uh, John takes a really wide fendente, like just wild. His hands are almost uh, less than shoulder width apart. But after this, no, no, keep going. We got to turn around. Um, Matt ends up on the other side, okay. on the right hand side. So let's just wait and play it out. Yeah, he spikes him in the side there. That's, I was sick. Well, he, yeah. he hooked him, That's a great. Bit, but it wasn't yeah. enough to really stun him because he just hooked yeah. him with the flu. Yeah. Okay, so now John's going to take this. Oh, camera blow, okay, yeah. at Matt. But Matt caught enough of it mm -hmm. deflecting off of his hat that it didn't drop him. Mm -hmm. That's a hand, like, that's a wicked blow. Yeah, that look at, and he ended up both his hands too. almost together, for fuck's sake. No, Jesus. That's the thing. Like, there's total energy. But, but Matt managed to catch enough of that with a half yeah. that he didn't catch the energy in his face. Yeah. Right? Later on, near the end of this fight, John manages one at exact range to hit yeah. the hound skull of the visor, right? And that Boom. is enough. Right because there. bang, there it is. He's done. Bam. And there it is on the visor. Bam. He hit him in the middle of the head. He hit him on the visor. Yeah, and he pulled, he and John, pulled the force John, out of that too. And John pulls it back and he thinks, well, let's keep fighting. And Matt says, no, no, that was a clean blow. Because Bam. why... Why continue after such a nice clean Bam. fight? Holy this is class. This is good yeah. fighting between yeah. honest people. Yeah, Matt, and, Matt you know just what? says, if, hey, you got me. Ready, if you're not ready for this kind of violence, <laughs> and I'll tell you, yeah. guys that fight in the, in the you know, uh, what they call the heavy medieval battles or HMB or whatever, um, yeah, yeah. guys that fight in that, they're really into the violence of it. But every one of them says, oh, no, 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 thrusts are way too dangerous. People would die. <laughs> well, it's because they don't control themselves at all. They don't throw their bullets yeah. at all. They hit each other with 12-foot pole axes in the back of the head. They will attack someone from behind with a 12-foot pole axe with a blow very much like uh, John Woods did yeah. do it now and Matt Brundle. But, yeah. okay. but thrusts are dangerous. Yeah, okay. But thrusts are dangerous. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, you know, like a couple of times I've been called out, let's go have a fight. And I say, fine, you called me out, we fight by my rules. End of conversation. Yeah. Period. They say, no, no, we don't fight with clones. I said, well, then you don't really fight. The medieval people did. I said, no, no, we fight according to King Rennie. I said, no, you don't. Mm -hmm. You know, you go down the rules of King Rennie. I said, well, if you attack from behind, you don't win the prize. If you, you know, a running attack and tackle, like sort of thing, you don't attack with a weapon, you don't win the prize. And, and, and just down the list of, of things that these guys think they're doing because someone else told them, well, that's how it was done. None of them do their own research. And you, as students at Emma, must do your own research to become scholars because we will call you out on it in your scholar test. And if you happen to go through your scholar test and win your prize, then you start learning the really scary stuff. Yeah, and then they'll and, and then they're gonna secret. they'll call you out for everything. You, you can <laughs> read this book anytime you want. It's free in the Emma Library. All of them are. If you aren't interested enough to look at this stuff and question the things that the free scholars and the provosts tell you, to say how did you come to that conclusion? Much like Bruce just did with yeah. Uh, uh, finesse on the left, pull out. If you do not do that, you never become a free scholar because you have to understand.
understand the material well enough because you've questioned mm -hmm. it. And you can question our answers. And our answers sometimes vary a little bit. I mean, mm -hmm. I got some, some problems with this business about um, middle iron gate being on the right side of your body until it becomes left iron gate. I, I got a problem with that because it doesn't do the things the text can do. But Brian, as provost, is convinced, or as, uh, yeah, as provost, is convinced that this is adequate because later Bolognese systems also use that convention. Well, as we, if we get into Vadi, which I hope we do, he doesn't. He calls it something else, right? Uh, Fiori never does that because he's got a very dis clear description of how it is. So to be a Fiorist, you must study Fiori. And to study Fiori, you must look at the text, the images, and whatever translations are available. Unfortunately for most people, Italians just especially this particular Italian is far too dense to get through. Uh, you can't use Google to translate it. You can't rely on the on the Florio dictionary, which is Elizabethan, deeply flawed, um, and which is like 200 years later, the terminologies were different. They were dealing with people that uh, didn't necessarily come from Fiore's uh, educational background and, and, and the part of uh, what we call Italy now was not Italy then. The Veneto, uh, the area around Venice, was much, much smaller. It, it was another, well, pretty much in, in the period towards the end of Fiori's life where Venice finally conquered Fiuli away from the uh, Holy Roman Empire and uh, then immediately, immediately was stuck with all the problems of the Turks on their border in Slovenia. Oh, the Turks. But, well, um, well, so just anyways, to yeah, just, just to, to wrap, just, just to wrap that up, I'm just saying, as potential scholars, and and if you're already a scholar, as a potential free scholar, if you're not studying this material and asking questions about things that don't seem to make sense to you or that you can't make work, you gotta ask because yeah. our interpretations are based on things we've tried. I mean, it was two years ago that a particular play. That has never made any sense to me suddenly made relative sense because brian said well try it this way and i did but because of my bias against passing weapons against my own leg sharp weapons against my own leg i, I, I didn't agree with it but i i tried it and then i tried it with somebody that i had shaken for about 10 seconds like i wasn't hurting my fellow scholar but i, I shook them i literally shook them till they were like blah, 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 and then pushed the the sword through and i thought well i guess it can work and that's the play where he's beating him with the pommel until he's tired um it, it takes it takes a lot of eyes to make a, a solid and defensible interpretation and we've had a lot of eyes on this for 20 years uh, and people that are very very good with the language and the culture i'm yeah. better with the culture than the language but really ask questions don't be shy. Yeah, and, and the reason why is it's um, very much worth coming to this point repeatedly over and over again uh, over time is that oftentimes um, the typical experience of an MS student is just in class. So when they're when they're uh, when they're studying Fury, they're on the floor in a recruit class, and the recruit classes by necessity are one cook in the kitchen, do what I tell you, and then leave, right? That's just how it has to be. That's a, that's that's called running a martial arts class at a at a at a basic level. But it would be bad. Uh, uh, it would be unfortunate if the student took that experience to be the whole bit, right? The scholar classes aren't like that. The scholar classes are much more collaborative, though usually they're they're still instructive. Um, the provost uh, Brian or a senior free scholar will be leading the class. We'll be studying material, but there's much more opportunity for for um, on uh, on the go feedback and, and and collaboration, and that only increases as you know as as you continue. So I, what we hope um, from these sessions that we're doing here, these back to the self study courses, to kind of show you. Um, 
you know, give, give a little taste of that collaboration at least and to see where you can go, right? To kind of get you excited about reading it yourself, thinking about it yourself, um, and, and participating in this collective interpretation that the Emma institution has been doing for 20 years because you're going to be part of it, you know, and, and 20 years from now, other students like you are going to be part of it too. Yeah. Uh, for example, scholar Alex, um, his last name is defeating me at this point. I can't get it in my old ancient head. Alex. He, uh, he, uh, it did leads our Raker classes. Uh, oh, Pedwasaki. Pedwasaki. Thank yeah. you so much. Mm. Alex Pedwasaki is absolutely the best scholar for saying, wait a minute, get it. Show me how this works. It just doesn't make sense. That's one of his virtues, and, yeah. And, and you know, it's uh, it's awesome because yeah. he's the one that will stop and say, "Look, I don't get it." And there'll be four other people that are sort of like, "Yeah, how does that work?" You know, yeah, yep. sort of thing. And this is this is a scholar that's been with us for a very very long time and been a scholar for a long time. This is the best attitude to learn because if you don't stop and question something, if you just say okay, well, this is the word of Brian or this is the word of Cal. You know, I can tell you all kinds of things about physical violence and causing people pain with nerve points and, you know, destroying joints and things like that. But can I remember these plays in sequence and say which plate is which? Not a chance. My brain doesn't work that way. I can show you how something works. I can show you how to defeat it based on Fiori and based on other opportunities. There are dagger plays from the Lichtenauer tradition or the German tradition, uh, well, one is specifically from Talhofer, that will always beat the sixth uh, master of dagger every single time. If you present the sixth master of dagger, these particular plays from Talhofer, which is 100 years later, will defeat them every time. And yet, Fiori has no problem making it work. Um, yeah, that sort of knowledge is something I can pass on to you, but Aaron can. Aaron can teach you things about body movement that I can't because my body doesn't work that way. It doesn't happen. I'm not a young guy anymore. And I'm sick. Um, oh, hello, same baby. Of, yeah. Same yes, same we're same talking way. about murder and death and violence. I know. That's right. It's so That's good. Right. Oh, you're hungry? Right. Oh, oh, daddy. That's the, daddy time's oh, over. Right. Uh oh. <laughs> Uh -oh. Carol, Carol wants a break. Daddy anyway, time's over. We're, Anyways. We're, uh, guys, um, those of you that came out tonight and asked questions, thank you so much. Yep. If, uh, again, if, um, you know, whoever it was that asked the question about comparing what we do at Emma to what other organizations do, um, I'm always available at kvacuta at emma.org. And I'll also... Um, you know, I guess I, I guess you could leave a question on this channel. I only pop onto it Monday and Wednesday night, uh, but I'll do my best to get back to you. And uh, you can pass it also through. If you, everybody seems to know uh, scholar Aaron Beatty in Guelph, you can pass it through him because he was the one that, that forwarded the question to me in the first place. I don't know who it came from, but uh, you know, sure, no problem. Uh, I'm, I'm here to help because I'm not there. I'm not going to be at your classes when Emma opens up again in Toronto or Guelph or whatever. I'm, I'm hoping to get to one of these Emma London study group uh, deals to see what's going on there. Uh, maybe, maybe towards uh, the end of the summer, early fall, I'll get to a Guelph practice. But I'm just too far away. All right, and with uh, with that, um, thank you guys again very much for coming. And this will be online in a, a few days, I'm sure. And um, we'll see you uh, next week. You, Aaron. Cool. Thank you, Joe. Good night. Good night. Have a wonderful Good evening. Thank you, Aaron. Good night, everyone.